there are any issues, if we're having any difficulty hearing or seeing me. Um, guys, my name is Bill McDowell. I'm COO of Accelerant Research. Um, and I'm going to walk us through a, a neat case study that, that, that we did uh, just hot off the presses um, during <laughs> this quarantine and COVID time period. Um, and it's in, in relation to the meal delivery service category, which, you know, as, as I'm sure you can all imagine, has been just off the charts in terms of uh, its emergence and, and its, its usage, right? And, you know, that's <laughs> in, in many cases uh, because we have to be, not necessarily because we want to be. So it, really interesting to ca category to, to sort of dive into. Um, if you're just joining us, I'm going to go through very quickly our quarantine virtual insights conference ground rules. Um, you know, here we are at the mercy of, of the technology that, that we're all living with day to day. So, you know, if, if my audio goes out, if I have any issues, I'm going to apologize ahead of time, but we will be able to record and capture all, all presentations today, not just the one that's happening right now, but, but everyone. Um, and we'll get those back on, on as archived versions after the fact. Um, I'd like for you to remind everybody to, to be respectful for, to one another. Don't troll or, or you know, get too insensitive in, in, in the comments section. Um, you know, do ask pointed questions. Do feel free to push back challenge. There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, keep it kind, as it were, right? And last thing is, you know, we're doing a virtual conference here. We want to make sure that we are, to the extent possible, engaging with one another, networking with one another. We can't shake hands, obviously, but we can chat with one another. So you, if you're logged in in the, in the Zoom conference, um, definitely feel free to get on board with the, the Q&A and, and the chat. If you are logged in elsewhere, um, get on Twitter, get on LinkedIn, uh, use the hashtag QVIC2020. Uh, talk about the content that you're seeing about, you know, feel free to reach out to, to other participants, engage with one another as you would if this were, were a, you know, run of the mill conference. Um, I will say the one thing differing this than your run of the mill conference is uh, it's being hosted by a research company. So, you know, you'll definitely notice some, some clunkier transitions from, you know, one presentation to the next. Um, apologies for that. We are a research company. Uh, we are not uh, an event planning company. Uh, bear with us, as it were. But, you know, we're all kind of in this together. Um, what we do have is some really great content. Um, and what I'd like to do is share some of that content uh, that the team here at Accelerant thought would be uh, a worthwhile kind of uh, case study, as it were. Um, I'm going to jump right in. So we wanted to be able to, and you know, I'm going to try my best as I as we're going through this to uh, keep an eye on the Q and A, to keep an eye on any chat that's going on. But uh, apologies, I have a tendency to get into Tommy Boy mode, and I may be overlooking. Um, Definitely, as I start to wind down, I'll, I'll try to, you know, to get back to that piece of it. Um, but if I don't, if you have a question, if I don't see you right away, um, I'll, I'll certainly try to get, to get back to you. Um, trying to get my chat windows uh, viewable here. Okay. So what we're going to be going over is a nifty little methodology that we've come up with at Accelerant, and we like to call it a comprehensive category study. Um, and the best way that I can describe this is, let's see, is the old attitudes and usage research study meets ethnography. Um, that's big time, right? Clash of the Titans. We're talking like Mothra meets Godzilla. We're talking, you know, Globetrotters and Scooby-Doo gang, uh, Run DMC and Aerosmith, uh, big deal type stuff, right? Um, I'm going to apologize ahead of time because those aren't going to be my only lame pop culture references throughout this presentation. Uh, it is what it is. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hit you with another pop culture reference. Uh, Adam Sandler from The Wedding Singer. Uh, and I believe his quote was, I have the microphone, so you will listen to every damn word I have to say. This is, this is where we are, right? Um, no, so a bit more 
kind of concrete about th this methodology and, and how it works and what it's all about. Um, so the A and U piece of attitudes and usage. Um, what we do is in this comprehensive category study, we approach the U by getting at actual usage, not necessarily just you know, stated from, from survey metrics. Um, no, we are looking for ways to get into database analytics, behavioral analytics, um, things that are essentially true reads of what people are doing, right? Um, what the consumers in a given category that we're studying are up to. Um, we also, when we're doing this type of category assessment, uh, we get into quanti quantitative research phase. So, you know, the behavioral we're going to be getting from, from the, these analytics, the sort of attitudinal coming from the quantitative, you know, marrying the two together, as it were, and then also qualitative research. Um, and in many cases, in the case that we're, we're going to go over here, um, this is done in the form of what we call show and tell ethnographies. Um, obviously, you know, and especially right now when everyone is dispersed and while some focus group facilities are beginning the reopen process, um, it's certainly a, a, you know, a, a clunky process, right? So a lot of folks are, are remote. Um, we are, are big proponents, even prior to quarantine, of this, this what we call show and tell ethnography. So it's, you know, rather than sending the team to um, a given participant's home, uh, we are basically engaging via webcam. Um, we get to get into all kinds of different, you know, screen sharing and, you know, asking people to toggle back and forth from, from, you know, stationary webcam to, to phone screen, uh, sharing screens on, on devices and, you know, being able to walk us around their homes, going on shopping exercise, all kinds of different, you know, neat techniques that are available to us in, in this show and tell ethnography, uh, as it were. Um, I've got my screen covered up, apologies. So, you know, in this case, for this case study, and kind of in general, so these comprehensive category studies that we do, they can be very custom in nature. What I'm describing to you is kind of, you know, an example and a fairly common example of how we, we tend to approach. Um, so we're talking, when we get into the quantitative phase of research, um, you know, 1200 category consumers who, are also sharing with us, you know, some types of uh, behavioral analytic feeds, and are also not all 1,200 going through qualitative, um, at least not the in-depth, you know, ethnographic interviews. You know, start doing the math on on incentives for, for, you know, in-depth half-hour, 60-minute, multiple-hour interviews uh, uh, among consumers, and it can get incredibly exp expensive and incredibly fast. Um, in this case, what we did was uh, 60 minute show and tell ethnographies. Um, and we did so among, I believe it was 20, 20 category consumers. Um, but again, you know, these are folks that are a subset of the ones that we talked to for the quantitative research and the ones that we were assessing their, their, their behaviors. Next slide. So we've got this, this deck that I'm going to be going through today, and it's, it's, it's broken into three types of slides or color coding. Isn't that fun? Um, we're looking at blue methodology slides, gray finding slides, and the gold kind of implication slides. Um, and we're going to kind of hop back and forth and, and, and swirl around, as it were, as, as we're sharing this. Um, you know, the thing that I can say about the study that we're we're going to get into here is that this was a self-funded study. Um, so we have, you know, a fake client, as it were, that, that we, we did this for. Um, but what that means is this is proprietary research that Accelerant conducted. We, uh, this is not a joint presentation with, with one of our client organizations. This is a study that we did independently. And as a result, we're able to name names, we're able to share actual data and results. Um, and hopefully, you know, it, it's some very interesting data and I think you'll be able to, to take a lot away from it. Uh, what we'd really like for you to be able to do is 
you know, some of what we're going to share is, is going to be relevant to your particular industry. Some of it is not, um, but we're really trying to get into some, you know, just inspiration. Um, mentioned these three phases of research, you know, the analytics, the quant, and the qual. Um, anytime we're approaching a study like this, it, it you know, it, the order in which we, we do those, it, it can vary quite a bit. The objectives that, that we're looking at or, or getting into, um, they can vary quite a bit. So, you know, we try to customize as best we can, you know, while staying true to these sort of three legs of the stool, as it were, right? Um, and again, you know, the idea being that we're getting at sort of that comprehensive picture of whatever category we are studying. So Accelerant has a panel, um, you know, a, a, an online insights community. Uh, the name of it is Agora. You know, this is our proprietary panel. In addition to conducting research, you know, just administering surveys, uh, doing qualitative recruiting and, and, you know, doing qualitative full service research studies with folks. We also ask our participants to opt into certain uh, feeds uh, of behavioral or usage, um, you know, data feeds essentially. Um, and these, you know, can be kind of all over the map. Um, some are ongoing, some are just point in time usage diaries, for example. Um, you know, it may be a certain study that, that folks are asked to, to, to engage in, um, and it's something that is, is finite. Uh, but what we're starting to, you know, realize and recognize is this sort of, you know, big data picture that, that is taking shape and how we can, on a case-by-case -case basis, tap into these different feeds. Um, and when we're talking about data feeds, uh, among our panel members. I'm certainly not rec um, referencing like a Cambridge Analytica type of, you know, unbeknownst to them, you know, scraping and, and capturing and then selling off personal data. Um, in fact, this is very beknownst to them. Um, this is all opt-in. This is all paying participants for whatever information it is that they're sharing. Um, I think that is a huge sort of, you know, looking forward to, to, to the future of, of insights and of, you know, our value as researchers. Um, you know, I think blockchain was, you know, it's been a buzzword in recent years. And, you know, every time I hear someone talking about, you know, its application to, to the insights world, it's this kind of appeal that we can allow consumers ownership of their data and when is it appropriate to share such data with with research companies with end users with you know the world in general um when we did our conference last month in, in april we had a, a representative from smr talking about uh, data privacy um you know all of the not just within you know the, the COVID environment but just in general you know we're getting better and better at being able to, to target and to, to grab information from consumers. We just have to be very careful about how we do it, what we do with it. Um, I'm a huge proponent of fair compensation. You know, uh, a consumer or a panel member is sharing information with us. We want to make sure that we are making it worth their while. This is what keeps them coming back. This is what keeps them longitudinal. And this is, you know, from a research standpoint, what's keep, what keeps them high quality and what, allows us to be able to, to tap into their information over and over again. Okay, so, you know, that's the, the behavioral piece of it, right? We've got these, these myriad different types of, of, of data feeds that we can be tapping into. Um, and, you know, what is our approach with the, these types of data? It, it's really trying to fill in blanks. Um, when we embark on one of these types of category assessments. We're not looking to reinvent the wheel or, you know, encroach on, you know, there's a ton of secondary data feeds that are already in place, secondary research, um, you know, scanner data, all kinds of, of information that, that is available. Uh, what we're looking to do is, you know, formulate a plan that's going to help to sort of address some of the blind spots that may exist in, in these types of, of data feeds, right? 
and we're doing so on, on a very you know case by case custom basis okay we're looking at this category of consumers let's figure out what we know about them what we don't know about them um you know you think of you know loyalty program members for example or customer database um obviously those are very inward looking and we don't necessarily know in addition to what's happening you know in, in the organization's customer database what are these folks doing in addition um and that you know you can get into all kinds of loyalty implications there um you know nps for example uh we know what our shoppers our customers say or or think from a likelihood to recommend standpoint from an advocacy standpoint but we don't necessarily know how immune they are to 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 others in, in the marketplace to, to competitors um you know th these types of data feeds help to sort of unearth some of that so great you know you're you're an advocate you're super likely to recommend me but you know from a share of wallet standpoint you're <laughs> running around town with every other provider that that's available you know is that truly a loyal customer um and then what we're also really looking to do is rely less on self-reported survey responses. You know, we need surveys and quant research to answer attitudinal um, and, you know, to the extent possible for people to tell us what they're feeling, why they're feeling it. But when we ask questions, you know, about purchase habits or dollars spent or, you know, things that, someone may have done, that's where a lot of recall bias can come into play. Um, so to the extent that we can have these data feeds that help us validate and understand, you know, truly, okay, did this person buy Oreos in, in the past three months? Or, you know, is it more like, you know, six, eight months ago, you know, are they not recalling it quite as accurately as, as you know, they may think they are? Uh, we use this method a lot for, you know, as a sidebar, not even getting into like a, a broader um, kind of foundational category assessment. We use this a lot for just qualitative research, uh, recruiting, for example. Um, you know, we need to, in a focus group, sit, you know, eight people who have engaged with or shopped a certain store in the past three or four months. Um, using a, a data feed like this, we can actually, you know, get at that truly. Um, we don't have to rely on the self-report. We, you know, in some cases, people, they do try to, you know, lie their way into to a research study um, in order to, to get the incentive. Um, and if they can talk the talk, oftentimes they, they can make it through. Uh, with, you know, a, a data feed that can validate them, that's, you know, it's, it's always a, a good thing. And we can get into true share of wallet assessments, right? Okay. So I'm going to start going into some actual results here. So I'm, I've kind of at least tried to get at, I know it's a bit of a squishy topic and it's kind of broad, but you know, keeping in mind, it's these, it's these three pillars, these three legs of the stool, right? We've got the analytics, we've got the quant research, we've got the qual research. And what we're doing is looking at a particular category. And, you know, it, it's important to, I guess, when you embark on analysis like this, you can't just want the world in terms of, I want you know, to know every single thing about every single person. No, you have to, to set objectives, just as if you know, you're embarking on any type of research study. You know, what is it that you're looking to learn? Who in the organization is gonna be the end user recipient of this information? Uh, you know, what is it all about? And that helps you shape your game plan, your learning objectives, and help to answer, you know, okay, which of these different types of data feeds should be, we be implementing for this type of study. All right, so, you know, I'm going to, to take us back in time to, to start off with. Um, back to January, remember January? It was so long ago, um, we were, you know, kicking off a new year, new decade, we were so, you know, excited. We were so doe-eyed and, and innocent um, before, you know, the world started to really smack us down. We just met baby Yoda, like things were looking great, right? 
Um, and then <laughs> something happened along the way. We had a leap day. Yeah, it was so exciting. You know, there's some bad things happened. We had, you know, we lost Kobe. We had Australia wildfires. But, you know, from a consumer standpoint, we were sort of just plugging along. Uh, and then we weren't. Um, you know, and this is the assessment that we're doing. This is all in context of, you know, consumer usage, consumer behavior, uh, trying to avoid uh, a lot of the health implications or, you know, all that is, you know, crowding the headlines with regard to, to COVID. This is really about, okay, I mean, we're all researchers, we're all, you know, serving organizations. So we want to know what is it that consumers are doing, right? All right, so here we go. First week of March. Um, that's when the hoarding started, started to set in, right? Uh, then we got into a bunch of shutdowns. And so, you know, I've got a, I've got a timeline laid out here, right? Um, so as part of our, and I, first of all, I'm going to get into each of these in detail. So don't anybody worry about the fact that there's a lot of jumbled mess right now on this page. But as far as our first step in, in you know, the, the assessment of the, of the category we set out to assess, um, you know, we, we first, you know, looked at essentially expenditures. So, you know, weekly budget of U.S. consumers right so week to week what are people spending and what share of that is going to a bunch of different categories that we looked at a bunch of different types of purchases um as you can imagine you know the, the share of you know for example clothing purchases is obviously going to be much smaller on a weekly basis than you know your share of grocery purchases or you know what you've been spending on mortgage and rent is obviously going to be far and away more than you're spending at coffee shops. Um, what we did is we basically to try to sort of normalize, bring everything into, you know, comparability. We, we started with, okay, so to what, we're looking week by week here, right? So to what extent does that category that we're looking at represent the share of that week's outgoing expenditures for, for a consumer? Um, and then we essentially between the beginning of January and the end of April, we indexed these. So, you know, if I'm looking at, you know, a perfectly stable category where it represents the same share of purchasing um, from week to week throughout the first third of the year, you know, I'd be looking at in this jumbled line graph that you're looking at, I'd be looking at just a, you know, a, a flat line in the middle of the screen, right? So that would be, you know, going, going in that regard. Uh, well, instead, what we see is a lot of volatility and that's what we're gonna get into and, you know, what was happening. So, you know, winners and losers during the age of COVID. So we looked at, you know, the, the hoarding that was beginning to take place. Um, you know, the lockdowns that, that were going into effect, um, you know, there are certain categories, as you can imagine, as I'm sure you've been reading about, um, that have done really well um, versus others, not so much, you know, so we've got the, you know, the me Drake meme one to represent the losers, Drake meme two to represent the winners. Um, okay, grocery, that's the first category we're going to look into. Um, you know, for the first part of the year, kind of bopping along, no, no, no biggie. Um, everything is staying relatively normal. Um, then it got to be, you know, March and hoarding time, and you'll see, you know, a, a pretty big jump in the share of one's outgoing, you know, weekly expenditures that's going to grocery. And it coincides with everybody stocking up on, on the toilet paper and the disinfectant and everything else, right? And what you've seen, you know, since then, as we've kind of embarked on and, and gotten deeper into shutdown, well, it keeps going up. Um, you know, and we've got this dip here after the first couple of weeks of shutdown. Quite possibly, this was when people were realizing that, you know, the world is not completely over. I am going to be able to go back to the store so I can start, you know, actually using some of this stockpile that I've, I've gathered. Um, 
And I will say, you know, with the hoarding mentality, we had a great presentation um, during last month's conference uh, by Mona Patel. Um, she did a very interesting bit of research on the whole mindset of the, the toilet paper hoarding, um, why people did it and, and what that was all about. Uh, so I recommend that you check that out if you haven't seen the archived uh, presentations for, for last month's conference. Um, okay, so we look at Walmart uh, in a very similar trajectory, right? You know, starting off the year normal and then just, you know, kind of up, 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 <laughs> you know, a, a big spike around hoarding time. And, you know, it, it's interesting that Walmart is, you know, among the, the flatter of the, uh, the lines that we're going to look at. And, I mean, if you think about that, they're, you know, one of the sole retailers or establishments nationwide that's been sort of, you know, open the whole time, right? They, you know, and, and, you know, relatively crowded. Amazon, you know, similar and interesting results. Um, so we look at, you know, kind of ahead of the curve, as it were, for, for, for hoarding. Um, we saw a lot of people flooding, flooding Amazon, uh, presumably for these stock up materials. But then, you know, since shutdowns have been in place more and more Amazon share of purchasing happening, right? Um, this one is, is fascinating. And this is, this is ATM withdrawals. Okay. So, and I will say that, you know, the left-hand side of our, our chart here, we're looking at, you know, the first week of January that actually begins at January 5th. So you see a, a spike on ATM withdrawals that under normal circumstances, and we don't see it for January because we're missing that you know, first few days, but under normal circumstances, you see a bump every you know, beginning of every month, right? And that has to coincide with you know, payday and people withdrawing. Um, you see, you know, and, and that's normal for, for, for February, for you know, early-ish March. Uh, and then you, know, you see a much closer <laughs> peak um, as people are, are, are stocking up and, you know, going through the, the hoarding, right? Um, but then what you see is just an immense drop off as people are shut down, staying at home. So, you know, if you're in the financial services industry, you know, consumer banking, those ATM fees that, you know, are a normal <laughs> part of, of, of the business model have been, you know, all but drying up in, in recent weeks. Um, Interesting that we see this kind of bump um, in the middle of April as well. Wondered what that was all about. And guess what? It coincides um, with people receiving their first round of stimulus, right? So they, they get their direct deposit and they're hitting, hitting the ATM. Uh, Rideshare services, the Ubers and Lyfts of the world. Wow. Um, huge drop uh, for those guys, which, you know, it, it definitely makes sense, right? Um, you know, we saw a bit of a bump leading up to the, the, you know, hoarding fest and then just off the map in terms of, of, of decline. Pet care category, um, you know, followed similar trajectory to, to, to grocery um, and a little bit of an unfair assessment here because it, pet care, this doesn't necessarily represent just, you know, I mean, you can definitely see the folks were out you know, buying up big bags of Alpo, I'm sure, during, you know, the other hoarding that was going on. But, you know, pet care also represents grooming. It also represents, uh, you know, veterinary services, which, you know, in large part, unless emergency, have, you know, dwindled quite a bit. Apparel, another big drop. Um, you know, we saw in middle January, it looks like, uh, Presumably, people you know hitting the malls, cashing in gift cards, um, and then you know steady until stay at home <laughs> started to kick in, and then wow, um, just a huge drop. And I mean, if you've been looking at the headlines, you've you've seen what's been going on of late. You've got you know the J.C. Penneys of the world. You've got the the J. Cruz, Neiman Marcus. Um, a lot of very visible um, struggles being seen by by. Uh, uh, apparel retailers. Coffee shops, I thought was, a, it was an interesting because you saw a really big bump um, in advance of stay at home, you know, get out, stock up on your, on your Joe. Uh, I guess, predictably a decline as people were staying at home, but then, you know, a bump 
uh, around the same time people were uh, getting those uh, stimulus payments. Hey, who knows? Maybe they, they hit the ATM, they hit the, the coffee shop for, for a recharge while they were out. Fast food is another one, and we're start, what we're starting to get into and narrow into here is, you know, the, the subject matter of, the, of this case study that we're doing. But we couldn't help ourselves. There's just so many interesting, you know, kind of, and and the way we like to to approach this this type of study or the analogy that we like to provide is, you know, so we talk about the, the three stool or three legs of the stool, right? The, the analytic, the quant, the qual. Um, a lot of times we. We kind of liken those to, you know, think of Google Maps, for example. You know, you've got the, you know, very broad global view. You've got the more narrow, um, you know, uh, city block view, and then you've got, you know, and we'll, you know, liken this to the qualitative, but you've got the, like the street view where we're looking at one individual, um, you know, one individual's viewpoint. And the neat thing about this type of category assessment is, you know everyone that we're looking at, they are all uh, kind of the, the same people. So those, you know, those folks that we're looking at on the Google Street View, they're also among that population that, that we looked at from, from an analytics standpoint. So, so, you know, very powerful to be able to zoom in and out as it were. Okay, so we were talking about fast food. Um, you know, you saw a, a pretty, pretty decent drop off as the, the the shutdowns began and that doesn't necessarily mean that fast food wasn't being consumed this is you know engagement with actual fast food providers and that's something that we'll get into in just a minute as well um restaurants kind of similar story uh big drop off as as the shutdowns went into place uh, a bit of a peak after the first few weeks though and Presumably, this is when you know restaurants started to to get their act together for from a you know a carry out and delivery standpoint, perhaps. Um, but what we looked at, and you know the the subject we couldn't help ourselves to to dig into deeper for for this case study was meal delivery services. So these guys are the beneficiaries of that. You know that drop off in in you know fast food in in restaurant dining. It's you know the DoorDashes, Grubhub's, Uber Eats, Postmates of the world. Wow, I mean it's just insanity how you know steep this curve a, a, has been growing, um, and it's it's such a fascinating category because you know we're kind of as consumers we're we're, we're sort of forced into uh, our our usage of of these right. Um, so to what extent, you know, if I am a DoorDash or, or, or a Grubhub, you know, am I sitting back and just, you know, enjoy it while it comes? Um, or am I really digging in and trying to assess, you know, okay, I've got these folks. <laughs> I didn't have them before, but here they are, they're captive audience. What am I doing to try to keep them once this is all over, right? Um, and we can see that some are doing it well and some not so much. Um, so let's see, we, okay, you know, that was the, the broad kind of, kind of narrowing. Still within this, you know, we, we can look at not just, you know, their share of, um, you know, how they're using a, a given category, we can also zero in, and in this case we did, on which providers they're using, you know, and provide a true share of wallet. Um, this isn't self-reported. This is based on actual transactions that people are actually making. Um, and it's, it's fascinating. You look at, you know, and this is the, the, the big four, uh, Postmates, Grubhub, Uber Eats, DoorDash, um, that make up the vast majority of, of, of purchasing in, in this category. Um, so that's, that's who we, we looked at for this assessment. But if you, you know, I think all are benefiting from this, this wave of, you know, new purchases that, that are happening. Um, but you, you can see, you know, and we broke this up to looking at, you know, a collapse to January and February versus March and April. Grubhub didn't get the memo. <laughs> and Uber Eats is really, you know, from a share stealing standpoint, able to, to kind of take advantage of that. Um, it's fascinating, you know, and, you know, 
possibly the impetus behind, you know, what a lot of us have probably seen in the headlines of late, um, <laughs> that Uber is, is making a play for, for, for Grubhub. Um, you know, and we actually, so, you know, we'll, we'll get into a little bit of this, of this as well. So, you know, we hop back and forth. We're looking at, you know, these, these more macro issues and taking a step back, um, you know, the approach that we took with, with this research, the, the kind of viewpoint that, that we decided to take was that of, you know, if we're in one of these organizations, if we are the, the consumer research or insights team, um, you know, to what extent can we, you know, help inform the organization, uh, look for opportunity areas, help to de describe what's going on. There's a lot of talk out there um, and assessment of, you know, even the long-term viability of this whole meal del delivery app service model, right? You know, there's a ton of VC money going into these guys. There is a lot of question as to whether long-term this can even make it as an idea. Um, you know, can this even achieve profitability one day? Um, that's really not what we're getting into with our assessment. You know, ours is just as it's, it's the research angle of this, right? You know, how can we help along those lines if we were, you know, in this organization, right? So, you know, we did our, our, our macro with the analytics, we did our, you know, narrowing with the, the quantitative survey, we did, you know, our super focused with, with the qualitative, and we did these via uh, what we call these show and tell ethnographies, these are webcam based. Um, here's just a, a quick clip from one of ours. This was uh, Carmen, and she was talking about Grubhub in, in specific, you know, very quick clip, clip from her. And forgive the yeah, we tried to you know do a funky blurring uh technique from from powerpoint uh it reminds me of the take on me video from aha if you remember back in the 80s i'm definitely dating myself i'm just gonna get out of the way and get started on this uh, my name is carmen and i am calling in from los angeles i live in the valley it's like 20 minutes from hollywood and it's actually raining today it never, never rains um, um, so yeah, it's actually, it's, it's pretty nice. Um, I think my most used and favorite uh, meal delivery service is Grubhub, but it might be changing a little bit during, during this pandemic. Oh, interesting. We'll definitely be talking about that some more. Okay. Ooh, and we will be talking about that. So the voice that you heard was, was that of uh, Erica, our moderator for the study. Um, Carmen was, was the participant on her webcam talking with us in detail about about what you know the, the subject matter um, and you know just to describe it a little bit more this it was very interesting the qual piece of this uh, what we did is we call them show and tell ethnographies um, in this case we did at mealtime a one hour interview with with consumers so we you know from uh, you know I, I'm hungry <laughs> I'm trying to decide what I want to eat where I want to to, to get that food from all the way through the ordering process, all the way through the waiting and the delivery and the communication, and then even the, you know, post delivery, you know, unbagging and, and, and usage. Um, there aren't a ton of categories where you can spend an hour and do, you know, a full blown, you know, purchase cycle assessment, but, you know, this is one of them. And it, it's just kind of a fascinating way to be able to, to, to over the shoulder and to, again, be able to marry that with, you know, these, these quant and, and analytics results that, that, that we're capturing. Okay, so, you know, there, you kind of come to a, a, a crossroads with a study like this. And I, I think I alluded to this earlier, but, you know, I'll, I'll definitely underscore that you have to set objectives if you were trying to embark on a kind of a massive category assessment like this you need to know what it is that you want to, to be learning at the end of the day. Now, there's nothing wrong with, you know, taking a bit of an exploratory tone to it. Um, you know, the whole point of doing research is to, to learn, right? But you have to at least know or have hypotheses and plans about what you want to do with this information. Um, so what we did was we came up with, you know, basically a fake client, right? So we are, you know, a research company serving a 
DoorDash or, or Grubhub, whomever. Um, and, you know, put ourselves in their shoes, made up kind of fake research objectives. Um, in this case, we really wanted to kind of narrow in. So, you know, different avenues that we could be taking, we could be looking at this from a, a marketing research standpoint, like a consumer research standpoint, usability research standpoint, uh, innovation standpoint, you know, a lot of different directions we could be taking this. And it's not as if, you know, you do this research and it must, you know, answer questions only with regard to one of these buckets. But you do have to, you know, prioritize and, and set plans. Otherwise you get into this, you know, kind of big data dilemma where you're just inundated and you never get out of the sifting process, right? So you set objectives. Um, in our case, we were, we're serving marketing. Um, so our fake client, um, wanted us to look at category consumer personas, right? So we're going to do a, a, a segmentation study. Um, and we're really looking to just understand and personify those, you know, those different segments in terms of, you know, what makes them tick? How can I target them? How can I, you know, better get in touch with them essentially? Um, segmentation study that you know I'm sure many of us have had a lot of experience with, right? Um, so who we targeted from a you know just a, how we defined our our category users. This is anyone who has used one of these delivery services in the past 30 days, um, and this research was done uh, over the course of. Gosh, what month is it now? May. Uh, this was uh, mid-April, so right smack dab in the middle of lockdown that we conducted the the quant and qual uh, research assessments. So definitely not something that can be, you know, obviously all things to 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 all people. We do have to set those objectives, and we do have to to narrow our focus a little bit. All right, and I am rambling quite a bit. I've spent the vast majority of our talk on the first <laughs> leg of the stool, but it, it's exciting. There was, there was some really good stuff to talk about. And, you know, the, the pieces that I'm getting to, into now are a little bit more familiar. I, I definitely, you know, maybe we don't spend a ton of time on, you know, the actual results from, for, from each of these definitely not from, you know, each of our segments go, I mean, there's an immense amount of detail you can go into to each. Um, so I'll kind of hit the highlights. Uh, yeah, did a segmentation. Um, we're talking old fashioned attitudinal segmentation survey instrument. Um, and, you know, we followed the, the pillars of, of, of a, you know, a, a good attitudinal, attitudinal segmentation. So start with summarization and reduction, principal components, factor analysis, getting into k-means cluster analysis, uh, goodness of fit through discriminant function analysis, and then ultimately, okay, we've got our segments, now it's into profiling them. Um, and the old school way of doing that is based on other pieces of the questionnaire, right? All the self-reported information, the demographics, the you know, profiling, the media usage habits, the, everything that, that we collect in our you know, massive survey. Well, in this case, a ton of that information is not collected via the survey instrument, but via these data feeds that, that we've already established. And you know, what this allows us to do is not, again, not rely on the self-report necessarily, but rely on actual <laughs> usage. So when we're getting to, into profiling of these personas and, and these segments, we are able to, you know, literally size them from, from, from a dollar value standpoint, you know, what do they represent? You know, how do they act? What makes them tick? Um, really powerful stuff. So we came up with four distinct segments. Um, two that we're going to focus in on the other two. It's not as if they're not important, but you know, it, this is like the Julia Child's, you know, cooking show. Um, we're not going to sit here and watch her, you know, peel the potatoes for, for, for 20 minutes. Um, no, uh, these, you know, highly targetable, really good, great information. If you were the inclined on this, you would be all over the, the results that are coming from it. Um, but we're, we're focusing in on just two of the segments. And we're 
a little crunched for time, so I'm going to zoom a little bit through these. Um, we've got segment one, trapped with children. Um, and any excuse for me to use, you know, my hero Al Bundy is, is definitely one that I'm going to take full advantage of. Um, you know, this segment, I'm just going to read off some of my, my notes about them. You know, these folks, they tended to be millennial. They tended to have children living at home. They tended to have no real strong preference for meal services. Um, they are kind of out there using all of them. Um, and this is a really interesting thing about this, this, this whole category is the, you know, the non-loyalty that comes into play. A lot of, you know, one's choice when it comes to, to a meal delivery service has to do with, guess what, distribution challenges, like any, any type of, of marketing or, or, or delivery. Um, what restaurants are, are, you know, providing this. Um, in many cases, folks are using multiple providers and same, provi or same restaurant offering different menu items and offerings for different items. So, I mean, it, you know, from this assessment, it's just, you see tons of opportunity for someone sitting in these shoes. Okay, you know, I am this provider, I'm getting this influx of traffic what do I do to, to keep them here? I, you know, I'm doing this research. I'm understanding the pain points and what makes these people tick. <laughs> now, how can I shape my messaging? What can I do? Um, this trapped with children, one of the, you know, really big takeaways among them is substantially higher you know, dollar share based on their, so we looked at the behavioral, we looked at the dollar share that's going to um, meal service delivery these folks, the trapped with children, they represent 27% of the meal delivery service audience, but, and I don't have it in front of me, I'm scrambling on my notes, but a much higher proportion of, or share of the dollars that are being spent. That's huge, right? Uh, uh, another segment that we looked at is the we'd rather be dining out. These are very reluctant folks, right? They are they, as the name would imply, they are wanting to be dining out. They're sort of forced into this, you know, presumably they would be the ones who are very likely to, to jump ship whenever, you know, we get on, on the back end of this, but will some of them stick around? You know, they've, they've used these services or are there opportunities to, you know, to team up with, with local restaurants as a, a, a delivery service provider, um, you know, offer things that, you know, uh, maybe a dessert promotional, you know, okay, I'm, I want to go to the restaurant, hang out, but my belly is full. So head back home and have dessert waiting for me. I don't know, it just all types of potential possibilities for, all right, they don't want to be here. They are here. How can we, you know, try to hang on to as much of that, that share as possible. Um, these guys way over indexed. So, and this is again, not self-report. This is based on you know, actual usage metrics that we have way over index on uh, Hulu subscription. So, you know, if I am media buyer for DoorDash and I am trying to figure out messaging, you know, based on this segmentation that I've done, I'm finding out what makes them tick and what appeals to them. Well, guess what? Hulu is, you know, uh, an avenue that I would be very likely to, to, to want to spend on. How am I doing for time? Oh, let me zoom in. Okay, so we also did the show and tell ethnographies and I kind of described those earlier. These were, you know, the hour long kind of take us through the entire meal process. Um, just the, the really cool and rich information that we can get from this is, you know, we get into screen sharing, we get into, you know, unboxing or uh, unbagging, you know, getting into reactions and things that are happening right, right there in the moment, right? Um, and I told you we'd come back to Carmen, by the way, and, and we did. So, you know, she said, she's trying to describe why she was not so much into the Grubhub in the pandemic. So we'll watch quick video. Postmates charges a lot more services and fees. Like you, you think you're getting a free delivery or you think you're getting a discounted delivery and then you look and there's like $12 in services and fees. And I've, I have felt like in the past that Grubhub didn't charge that many services and fees, but mm -hmm. I have been noticing, 
I have been checking it out a little bit more through this pandemic. And I think they, I think they're starting to charge a little bit more for services and fees. Okay. Um, and it, it, if you click on the question, it's like, um, this is helping us cover our operating costs. So that's why I'm exploring other options like, like this Uber Eats. Yeah, and a couple of really cool things here. Okay, so number one, the thing that kept coming up over and over again, you know, not just in the qual, but in the, the quant as well with, with regard to Grubhub, you know, the frustration that, that folks are experiencing with them and the, you know, reason presumably that they're not, you know, spiking like, like the others is uh, logistics. Um, you know, a, a struggle to sort of keep up. It sounds like some, some pricing issues that, that, that have come into play as well. Um, and just from a model standpoint, I think Grubhub actually, you know, they rely in large part on orders being delivered by restaurants. Whereas, you know, in Uber Eats, they've got their network of drivers who, as we saw earlier, they're not, you know, their ride share isn't happening right now. So, you know, they're going to be on the ball from a, from a delivery, from the timing, from a customer experience and customer service standpoint, right? Um, and maybe this explains why some of the, the grub up was happening. So, you know, sidebar as well. Uh, so Carmen, as she was sharing this with us, you know, we're watching her screen, um, you know, as you know, the clock counts down and as she's waiting for her Uber Eats order to, to arrive. Um, just think about all the, you know, usability or, you know, over the shoulder shopping kinds of uh, implications that can happen here. A couple other really interesting things that we found from the, from the qualitative um, is the, I guess, change in behavior that, that, that we've been seeing um, from folks, even those that, you know, were using meal service delivery in the past, it, it ain't the same as it, it used to be, right? You used to meet the person at the door, you used to, and I'm gonna kind of go through and share okay, a video so here. This is from Emma, just who, by the way. And I have previously washed my hands. We'd rather be dining out so participants. Um, I am going to be heading so over. So she's, you know, actually, this is a video that she's taking over the shoulder, show and tell. We're going to the actual you know, delivery is arriving. I saw the guy coming out the door, and, and here we are. Thank you so much. Have a good day. All right, so here's the food here. Um, you can imagine so that, that came you know, really quickly, right on time. something like this from just an ethnographic. And then, and then right? All right, we'll come over here to the kitchen. But yeah, good example of, okay, you're not meeting the person at the door anymore. It's social distance. They drop it off and then get out of the Dodge. Uh, the hand washing that kept coming up over and over. So many of our participants wash hands before they receive their delivery, wash hands after, you know, in many cases, grabbing the Clorox wipes and wiping down every item. Um, here's a really good one from Daphne, who was one of our participants. Um, you know, Out of its original sharing what container she does and then put it in a glass bowl. The food itself, you know, under normal circumstances. Sometimes I do it just to reheat it. If it arrives hot, it's, it it's not going that to be, hot. you know, just eating so. it straight out of the container. But in this case, I'm going to heat it putting up it into something minutes. else because there is a fear of, you know, the contamination and dealing with, you know, these, these containers. So get it out of that, you know, get it all in the garbage as quickly as possible. Come back, wash my hands and then sit, excuse me, sit down and eat. All right, time check. So running out of time, um, out of its we'll spend a lot more time on this. Um, but here we are research, you know, research industry, and I'm going to use the, you know, cliche that's appearing and I'm sorry, I'm picking on Budweiser a little bit, but, you know, every ad that you're seeing of late has essentially the same thing that now more than ever in these uncertain times, it, you know, I don't mean to make light because it is, you know, a crazy situation and marketers are trying to figure out what to do, but, you know, this, this isn't going away as fast <laughs> as maybe any of us thought at the beginning. And from a research standpoint, we got to kind of figure this out. We've got to start to assess these these categories and, and understand what our consumers are going to look like. You know, today's version of your category consumer doesn't necessarily, and in fact, I mean, we looked at all those crazy line charts earlier. They definitely don't look like they looked, you know, a few months ago. 
And, you know, a few months from now, they probably won't look exactly like they do right now. But what's certain is that they're changing to some extent. Um, and the only way to really get at that is to do research, to assess, to, to, to try to understand and try to help your organization make the decisions, whether, you know, regardless of which side of the equation you are on, you know, if, which of the versions of the Drake mean you are, right? Are you the winner or are you the loser at this point? Everybody stands to, to, to gain from understanding, you know, who their people are. Um, and, you know, kind of the going forward, the, you know, we looked at the, the learning objectives crossroads before, you know, thinking about all the different implications of something like this, you know, how can it be applied to market research? Well, we talked about that kind of with, with the segmentation, how can it be applied to customer experience? Uh, I think we alluded to this a little bit earlier, um, this, you know, like NPS going beyond the, the customer database, you know, all kinds of uh, potential opportunities and applications. Uh, Fran's presentation this morning was great, you know, with regard to innovation research um, and test marketing, you know, it, can you take, you know, sort of this snapshot assessment in a, an individual test market versus the broader landscape and really get at not just, you know, do week over week sales increase for this thing that we've got out there, um, but, you know, what else are these people doing? You know, is this thing truly disruptive and changing the way that they, you know, behave altogether? Um, even volumetric forecasting, right? You know, getting into looking at what happens after <laughs> this, this, test marketing, right? Um, even usability, think about, you know, we, we, we looked at some of the examples here, but, you know, take like, I don't know, e-commerce commerce cart abandonments, right? Trying to narrow in and, and zero in on, th on that audience and, and what, you know, what they're all about and what makes them tick. All right, and I have totally just rambled on for almost the entire hour and it looks like there are questions. Um, guys, I am going to, I'm going to put my email into the chat. You definitely feel free to reach out to me with questions. I will definitely do my best to, to, to answer them. Um, yeah, sorry. Like I said, I, I, I tend to ramble at times. Um, I, I'll definitely do my best to, to engage, um, but it looks like we're, we're bumping up against the next presentation and I don't want to step on Margarita's toe. 